welcome everybody. This is a Friday noon meeting of the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee. And we're going to pick up a conversation we started on Tuesday, which is to um, really address the future of um, housing, starting with housing the homeless and uh, the people who have been homeless before this um, uh, situation we have done, this administration and the advocates have done yeoman work in getting 1,700 people or so who have been homeless, uh, who were homeless at the time of this pandemic uh, and the emergency period to get them into housing, um, primarily in hotel rooms, to get them out of the congregate settings. And um, there were some fears raised um, over the last couple of weeks that the stay at home order, which is due to expire on May 15th, may trigger something that um, quite frankly, none of us want to see. And, and, and that's every, everyone we've talked to um, feels the same way. And the um, uh, Commissioner Schatz is here to talk about um, the, the take from Insight AHS and DCF. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to pass the microphone to you, Commissioner, in, in respect for not only for your position, but for your time. And um, if you could fill us in, uh, when we last spoke, we were in that place of just taking that deep breath of saying, oh my goodness, we got this all done. And we got these folks into that place. And then of course I immediately turned around and said, okay, so now, and here we are, you know, and I wasn't the only one, but we are all in a place of, okay, so what's the next right thing to do? So um, I just like to go ahead and um, let you start with, um, with what's going on at AHS and share some of the thoughts that you had in the memo that you shared with us. And, um, and just, just to mention to the witnesses and to committee that this hour and 45 minutes is gonna go by very quickly. We have a lot of people. So um, so just I just wanna keep that in mind. I wanna be respectful of people's time. We have spent a lot of time in committees this week. Um, and so Rep uh, Commissioner Schatz, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much, Representative Stevens. This is uh, Ken Schatz. I'm the commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. I do really appreciate the committee's time in focusing on the issue of our homeless population and how we're dealing um, with addressing their needs and interests in light of this pandemic. It is incredibly challenging. I think it has been a, a really uh, positive story about um, the Vermont community coming together to actually do our best to address the needs of this particularly vulnerable population. So I start from, from that place. I do want to um, introduce Jeffrey Pittenger, who many of you know, he's our, my senior advisor and he'll stay along um, uh, on the committee, rest of the committee's hearing today. Uh, unfortunately, I will need to leave um, relatively soon after my testimony and finish of your questions of me. We, going to the point that uh, Representative Stevens mentioned, as I think most of you recall and are aware, we did in effect um, create an emergency exemption to our normal fairly restrictive rules regarding GA emergency housing in terms of motel vouchers along the lines of the all weather conditions waiver. We did this in light of COVID-19 and in light specifically of the governor's um, stay home, stay safe order which was due to expire, is due to expire technically still on May 15th. And so the waiver that we issued under the formal GA program was uh, to May 15th, consistent with the governor's order. But as Representative Stevens indicated, and we all do feel the same way, we know that we don't want to have uh, an abrupt change. So to be very clear, and we did send a memo to uh, stakeholders and the committee yesterday to confirm that we are not going to uh, close that waiver abruptly on May 15th. We are going to continue to allow those who are homeless to stay in motels uh, for the time being and as we work on and roll out a uh, transition recovery plan, which I do wanna talk a little bit more about today to give you a sense of, of what we're thinking and talking about in terms of an approach and even process to move forward because it is not a plan written in stone. It is actually at this point concepts that we want to 
engage you as the legislature, but also our many um, con uh, community stakeholders uh, to discuss, to make sure that we are doing um, the best we can uh, to make this transition that is gonna be important. And so let me start by um, talking about the fact that we, you know, we do feel good about the fact that as a state, we did effectively implement advice and recommendation from the CDC, from our own Department of Health, with respect to slowing the spread and of the outbreak of the virus, particularly with respect to the population of people who are homeless. Um, and frankly, good news is that as of today, I am not aware of any Vermonters who are um, experiencing homelessness who have tested positive for COVID-19. That certainly may happen. It's not as if the zero number is in effect uh, forever, but the point is we have been successful in um, protecting this vulnerable population. Something I think, again, as a community, I think we can all be proud of. We know we wanna get people into stable, safe housing. That's certainly something we've all been working on for years and we needed to move quickly, again, as the chair indicated in terms of, we had an approach that utilized shelters in a very significant way. That is um, an approach that we felt made a lot more sense than having people in um, numerous hotels all over the state. Uh, COVID-19 has certainly changed that, but we want to get back to uh, over the next nine to 12 months, if possible, uh, a, an approach that does recognize the need for stable housing that does not overutilize motels as a uh, stopgap solution for people who need emergency housing. So we're gonna look at a phased approach to reducing the numbers of Vermonters in hotels. Um, as the chair indicated, um, you know, we're actually close to 1,800 people in motels as we sit here today, including over 250 children. Um, a situation that is um, good to protect people for the time being under COVID-19 and the fact that they're homeless, but is not a long-term strategy. We know we're going to provide uh, uh, support for shelters to enable them to start up again. They'll have to do that consistent with uh, health department guidance. We know that they may need some additional support and technical assistance to enable them to reopen. That's certainly something that we are talking about. In addition, broadly speaking, I will say we also know, and this is where the legislature, I'm hopeful, will be a partner. We're going to need some new investments. We're going to have to recognize that there is a need for uh, a supportive housing in a variety of ways. We need to be thoughtful about what services really needed to be provided, really need to be provided for this population. Um, and that includes services for, with respect to mental health, substance abuse, and other issues that this population faces. We're clearly going to need some financial assistance in terms of rental assistance for this group of folks. And obviously the availability of actual affordable rental units is a key part of this challenge. So we're going to work on all of those things. And that's, as we go forward, again, we wanna recognize that what we did is unravel the system that we had in place, which as I said, indicated, uh, which was reliant to a significant degree on shelters. We've had to reduce the population shelters. Many of them have closed. Some have stayed open, but with reduced numbers of people there to be consistent with health department advice. And that's um, clearly, uh, important to recognize that those shelter providers are doing what we've asked of them. Uh, they have in, in fact stepped up and continue to provide support for some of this population in the motels that they're now placed in. So, so that is greatly appreciated. I do also want to mention this. I think you know that we did work um, with the State Emergency Operations Center to look at the need for isolation and recovery um, sites. And again, with respect to the homeless population, that we were very well aware they did not have a home to go back to, to stay safe. And so we did identify Harbor Place and initially the Holiday Inn as isolation and recovery centers. Um, Goddard was talked about as a recovery center. A tremendous amount of work was done by uh, community providers, by state officials to get those facilities ready in case we needed them. 
The reality is, and this is again good news, we have not needed them to any great degree. We have a small number of people in Harbor Place and Holiday Inn as we speak. We are um, no longer planning for the time being to use Goddard as a site for recovery, but this is all good news. And I just wanna to emphasize to the committee that from our perspective, um, this was really important work to be done. It was not wasted effort. We did not know six weeks ago what we were really looking at in terms of the impacts of the pandemic. So the amount of work that folks did um, is greatly appreciated, even if the utilization has been relatively low. That's a, again, that's a positive. And so again, with respect to the particular program that DCF runs, um, the General Assistance Emergency Housing Program, uh, we did first quickly recognize that there were very highly vulnerable people in shelters. And so we moved those folks out very quickly to keep them safe and get them out of the congregate facilities. And then we moved into um, this more general um, waiver of normal GA emergency housing eligibility rules. And again, as I indicated earlier, we intend to extend that uh, beyond May 15th. We don't have a date certain at this point. And frankly, I wanna be flexible. I wanna make sure that we do this in a way consistent with a plan to transition folks to safe housing. And so uh, that's what I'm gonna talk about now. Uh, the thoughts, the, the numbers a little bit and the thoughts we have going forward. And so to give you a sense of the, of the scope, we currently have approximately 160 households continuing in shelters around the state. Um, that's 58% less than usual. So it's a substantial reduction. And again, as I indicated earlier, that's because those shelters complied with the advice and recommendations of our health department and DCF. So they're doing what we asked of them and we appreciate that. But on the other hand, we have approximately um, 1,400, a little bit less than 1,400 households in motels. That's over 400% of what we saw last year. So you can see in terms of those numbers and the scope, the, the significant changes that we've seen. We're looking at 156 households with children, um, approximately 1,200 households without children, um, it, which gets you to over 1,800 people in motels, um, we, including, as I said, over 250 children. These are really big numbers. And, you know, we've struggled with this issue about how to count who's homeless um, in the past. And in some respects, this is an indication that the numbers, at least in my mind, are, are substantially higher than, for example, the point in time approach. And we always knew the point in time approach was not a totally accurate um, count, but this gives you a sense that whereas in January, the point in time count indicated approximately 1,100 um, people who are homeless, we're now talking 2,000 or more. And so it gives you a sense of the scope of the problem, which is really important to understand. It also includes, because this includes a significant number of people who are precariously housed. That is some of these people who are now in motels were people who were doubling or tripling up with family members or friends in, in situations that um, may have been short-term and may have sufficed but in light of the pandemic, they needed to get out, they needed to separate. And so it's reflective again of the population that we need to understand is in fact seriously homeless or precariously housed, so they come within that category. The, the reality here is that COVID-19, even though we're doing really well as a state and, and even nationally, we're certainly improving, but it's not gone. We are going to have to recognize it will be with us for a while. So for example, with respect to shelters, we cannot just turn around and say shelters can go back to doing business the way they did. They will have to reduce their capacity to be consistent um, with health department guidelines in terms of physical distancing, even as um, the impact of the pandemic um, decreases. So this is a long-term problem is my point. It's not like it's over um, on some day certain. So looking at this, we do recognize that this is a, a substantial number of uh, people in motels. We know eventually that the tourist industry will start to come back. And so the, the availability of these motels will actually go away uh, to a certain extent. And so we need to 
again, we can't just assume we can maintain people in these same motels going forward. We are going to have to adjust and we're going to have to pivot. And so we're trying to, again, um, do that in a thoughtful way. To that end, we're looking 12 to 15 months out to address the situation. And what we are talking about is a combination of short, medium, and long-term strategies um, to address this situation. By short-term, I'm talking about the next three months uh, between um, now and July. What we want to take advantage of and is the coordinated entry system that um, you, I think, are aware of. We can certainly respond to questions, but we have implemented that um, around the state. We need to now, with these additional people in motels, do a lot of hard work with our community providers to actually enter the data regarding the status of these people and also, frankly, analyze it and understand it better to make sure that we are providing the appropriate interventions needed um, by individuals and families who are homeless. And so we're going to need to increase our case management services for this population. We know that. Uh, we know that, that um, they're in this situation um, because they do need additional supports in terms of navigating our housing um, arena, and we need to provide that level of support. Um, and, and similarly, uh, with respect to mental health and substance abuse services, we need to provide those. And frankly, we're doing that now in many areas of the state uh, as we look to the next even three months and more, and while people are still in motels, we're hopeful to continue to enhance that level of support to address the needs of the population who's there now, and at least for the next three months, are unlikely to move quickly. But on the other hand, during this transition period, we are also looking at moving people out of these motels. To a certain extent, we may look for other temporary sites like other motels that are not likely to um, uh, regain usage during the uh, uh, rejuvenation of the tourist industry. That is, we know around the state, there's a few motels that may be able to be leased and we can move people into those for a longer period of time without being subject uh, to um, a week to week kind of situation. So we're looking and working with community partners about the potential in various parts of the state to move people into leased motel type situations as a transition phase. Um, again, with respect to shelters, we do think that we can move some people back into shelters, albeit with reduced capacity. Um, and so we're hopeful even to a small degree too, there are some people who have relatively um, short-term needs that we can move out into the existing um, rental um, unit capacity that does exist. Our nonprofit profit housing providers do have some vacancies. We're gonna work with them to try to support moving some of these homeless people into those vacant units. Similarly, with respect to the private rental market, there are some people who maybe we can move out relatively quickly. But it also moves into kind of the more medium term efforts that we know will take longer and will require some more substantial effort. And that does relate to securing new resources. Um, and again, you'll be a major player in that discussion and those decisions. So to the extent we need to enhance our housing navigation and retention services, uh, that's going to cost some money. And we're going to hopefully be able to use some federal funds for that. But and we're working on trying to uh, identify those costs and we'll be coming back to you later with respect to potential asks, but please be prepared for those questions coming your way or requests, I should say, coming your way with respect to resources. Similarly, we're gonna work with our providers to identify what both um, nonprofit providers and private market providers, um, what units can we access relatively quickly? Um, and to that end, we'll use programs like Vermont Rental Subsidy and other rental assistance approaches, recognizing that some of these individual and families simply can't afford the going rate uh, for rental units and they'll need some additional support to move into um, stable units. We uh, ate the, um, 
Agency on Commerce and Community Development, and you may have heard from them already, is certainly aware of the fact that there's a, a, a portion of our housing stock that simply needs substantial work to be ready and for people to move in. And so we're certainly talking with them about a rental rehabilitation program to fix up some of those units to enable people to actually take advantage of them. We also recognize that individuals need not only short-term assistance, but some of this population really needs ongoing permanent support. And so we need to recognize that a permanent supportive housing approach um, is clearly necessary and one aspect of this plan that we want to look at what's the level of funding that's really necessary to provide those supportive services on an ongoing basis. The, the um, other item that I would mention is of course something that you as a legislature have already addressed and, and that's the eviction prevention arena. Uh, you've taken some steps and from my perspective, I appreciate that on the short term with respect to COVID-19, but we're gonna talk about this within the context of a longer plan to try to provide some support to prevent eviction. Um, and again, that obviously has some financial impact to be sure, but we want to reduce the number of new individuals and families becoming homeless by preventing evictions. And then finally, one of the most challenging, of course, is just increasing the affordable housing stock. And honestly, we know that's a long-term uh, approach that does involve, um, again, the legislature, um, the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, and other partners. But clearly, as we look at these numbers of people in motels who are homeless and then turn and look to the housing market, we know we need increased capacity of affordable housing. So this is kind of an overall uh, concept plan that uh, we are talking about. We wanted to check in with you to see if you think we're on the right track. What we plan to do is going forward is work more specifically with community partners, frankly, with um, the Agency of Human Services, with ACCD, with the Agency of Administration uh, to come forward with more specific plans. Uh, we do look at this as a partnership, um, both with the um, legislature, with the administration and our community providers. We know we need to develop a budget and, and give you some more specific information. Uh, and we're working on that. And we expect to come forward with more specific proposals in that regard in the near future. So let me stop and um, offer myself up for you to uh, give me your questions and comments. One quick one for me, just to start, um, Ken, we've been asked by um, the HCB as a representative of a greater number of uh, stakeholders to ask them to convene kind of a task force that would, that, that kind of sounds like it would fit hand in glove with what you're planning. Is that something that you've heard about or talked about? And is that something that you would welcome? I would certainly welcome it. What's interesting to me in this world, and there's others who are more knowledgeable, we have a variety of committees, coalitions that meet. And my only comment would be, rather than creating something new, does it make sense to charge one of the existing bodies to do this work? But I'm open uh, to whatever approach, but I do agree that there are a variety of partners that need to put their heads together and work collaboratively and an integrated and work in an integrated way to move us forward. So whatever form that takes is frankly uh, fine with me. No, that's fine. I mean, I mean, what you testified, the way you testified, you sounds like you've been in our committee for 10 years. So, um, I mean, these are all outcomes that we would like to see, you know, that we've all been um, discussing um, but for the normal legislative and appropriations process. Um, so I think that we already have a leg up, at least in terms of what we want to do. It's just a question of having to get there. Um, Representative Triano. You're, you're good, we can hear you. I am. So um, just a few questions, uh, Ken. Um, do we have... Um, handle on in numbers um, who are episodic homeless, who are chronic, um, how many are individuals are we providing services to to keep them in place? 
Um, and what's the approximate cost of uh, an annual cost of services for someone with uh, mental health issues, uh, let's say, who has been placed at, in Harbor Place and uh, continues to get services in order to be able to integrate into the, the new housing? So let me try to answer your questions, and uh, and I may duck on some of them, but we do have some we we do have some information certainly about uh, the population we're serving. This is what the coordinated entry system ha uh, has provided us. So I can tell you in a summary fashion that we know about twenty five percent of the population of homeless people really have short term needs that we think that um, they, they're relatively discreet. A lot of them are financial, but um, it's short term. That we know that there's about 45% of this population have what we're describing as moderate needs. Um, they need more support to make the uh, step to affordable housing. Uh, and, and it does require more a higher level of services, including housing navigation and support, including some mental health and um, substance abuse. And then, but, but once we, and that's what, for example, the Family Supportive Housing Program that is some of you know, there's already a program within DCF certainly um, does, I think, in a, in a, in a very um, successful manner. But then we have what we refer to as the highest need about, of about 30% of this population. In my mind, sometimes that's referred to as the chronic homelessness um, category. That is, these are people that I was referring to earlier that I think we need to recognize and accept they have challenges and issues that are simply not going to go away. They are permanent. And so we will simply need to acknowledge that we need to provide permanent supportive housing for that population um, over time. You know, with respect to the, the, um, the uh, cost and, and numbers, Honestly, I don't have a great handle on that. I think that others may be more knowledgeable than me to be sure, but we do things now in a way that um, does have admittedly silos so that, um, you know, the DCF emergency housing program serves people who come into our program because they're literally um, no place to, to shelter, no money to do anything else, and we provide services. But on the, at the same time, the Department of Mental Health and through the designated agencies provides a lot of support to that population. The Department of Mental Health has its own housing assistance program that it provides both for short-term and longer-term housing. You can talk about the Department of Corrections too, is a major player here in terms of reentry. They provide a lot of housing support that also can include supportive services for people leaving the prison system. So it's a, a fairly complicated system. And going to the, the point that uh, the chair made about a task force, I am hopeful that as we go forward, we'll, we'll do better at, at really pulling these pieces together at, in an integrated way. And then frankly, might also do better at identifying the actual cost that um, is involved in providing the appropriate level of services. So just a quick follow-up. Uh, do we know if we rounded up uh, uh, many of the, uh, what I would call, what I would be calling chronic homeless, I mean, have we brought in the tent dwellers from outside of Burlington into, into this uh, number of 1,800 uh, housed in motels at this point? Do, you, do we have any notion as to that? So I'll respond um, based on my knowledge, but again, others may have more specific on the ground knowledge, but I think to a certain extent, the answer is yes, but I don't want to say 100%. I think that what we've seen, for example, you know, in Burlington was a very specific strategy when the um, warming shelter um, closed in Burlington because related to COVID-19. There was a very uh, uh, um, thoughtful approach that they could have closed. Some of those people might have moved into the existing GA program and into motels, but instead um, the community there working with the state identified that we want to enable those people to be sheltered rather than going into tents encampments. And so, as you may know, um, the state leased trailers, the city worked with us very uh, closely and the community providers to move those trailers to um, the North Beach campground in Burlington. And from my perspective, that was very uh, 
def definitely an approach to avoid having those people simply go into um, tent encampments. Instead, I think we're providing better support um, in that arena. And I think the um, openness to using motels around the state similarly has um, enabled people to be comfortable moving into those settings as opposed to staying in, temp in tents. Outstanding. If, if, I, if I may add um, um, to your questions, Representative Toronto, I think this is, it's worth reiterating that this, um, despite the traumatic events that we have found ourselves in, this is an astounding opportunity for us as a system of care, because we have an enormous number of folks in motels at this moment in time, and we can use things like coordinated entry to conduct the, uh, the necessary assessments to be able to put real numbers to what you're asking. And I think our community partners are doing an incredible job of reaching out to folks in motels and trying to get as much of that information as possible. Many of those folks that we are housing are currently in uh, the system, in coordinated entry already, but there is a, a significant swath that is not. Uh, and so we're working very quickly to get those folks uh, into the system and assess so that we understand that need a lot better. Representative Kolaki. Uh, Commissioner, thank you so much. Uh, I have to, I, I'm very grateful for everything you and your team have done. It's pretty extraordinary. And uh, I just have a few questions to make sure I understand this phased approach over the next three months. So the hotel vouchers will, some of them will be phased in and stay and others will be transitioned. And you, you said uh, case management will also be provided for these individuals. Will the food that's being delivered to their hotel rooms every day, will that continue over this phase approach as well? Yes, it is that we do have a system to make sure consistent again with the health department guidance that we limit um, the exposure. So at least for the time being, we will continue to deliver food, you know, depending on how uh, progress goes with respect to addressing the pandemic and the governor and the Department of Mental Health guidance with respect to um, um, continuing contacts in communities, certainly that might evolve over time. But for the time being, um, we are continuing to provide food to people in shelters. And again, many in many respects, again, a tremendous compliment to the people in our community, both our formal community providers, but also the, a vast array of volunteers all over the state who are helping out. And then my, my second and last question is, in, in South Burlington, where I am, um, the, the Holiday Inn was a backup. And from our city manager now, we're not gonna need that, is that correct? Or how many people are currently there and are you transitioning them out of that hotel? So uh, what I will tell you is there's a, uh, only a handful of people at the Holiday Inn as we speak. And again, as I indicated earlier, that's really good news. Um, I know there's conversations going right. I mean, we all need to appreciate that. I know there's conversations going on about the um, future use of the Holiday Inn. That is happening um, more directly from the state um, emergency operations center. So. I actually don't know uh, the, the um, answer to that question as we speak. I think it is uh, currently being discussed and considered. So I don't know what the future of the Holiday Inn is. Thank you. All right, um, Representative Walls and then uh, Haas. Thank you. thank you, thank you, Commissioner. I, I had to leave the room briefly while you were talking and I apologize if I missed this and you already addressed it, but I'm sure uh, what I'm thinking about is, has occurred to other folks that we may have the opportunity here to address a couple of issues. Uh, I was prompted by the news story this morning that Green Mountain College campus is going on auction. And hmm. considering the, the issues we have at Northern Vermont University at Johnson & Linden, I wonder if there's an opportunity there to perhaps repurpose some of those facilities. And in the case of Northern Vermont University, uh, perhaps help them stay open and, and, and find a way to accommodate more of the homeless. 
I, I want to be careful to stay in my lane in terms of not talking about the future of the state college system. But having said okay. that, I, I want to be a little careful. Um, but um, but but the, but I do appreciate the point of as we look at the need uh, to address the capacity challenges that we have, we do need to look at those available properties and sites around the state to see um, what appropriate uses can be made. Although I can't also resist mentioning, I also want to be careful. We learned some lessons in the 60s and 70s about creation of housing for low-income populations. We don't want to create ghettos of low-income housing. And I know that's not what you meant, but I do just want to be careful that we all recognize that to the extent we're going to expand capacity, my personal view is I think we need to look at mixed income housing um, to make sure that we don't um, put people in a situation where there's added stigma um, based on where they're living. Totally agree with that. Thank you. One of the things that popped up in the last conversation was, like, oh, well, there might be a nursing home available here or there, which to me is quasi congregate housing. I mean, and across the country, we've seen where that may not be the best idea either, but at least it's out there for discussion. Um, so Representative Haas is here. Again, we had kept an open invitation to members from these health um, and human service or the human services committee from next door to us. And I see that we have um, representative Haas and representative Wood has joined us as well. So welcome to house general and um, please uh, microphone's yours, Sandy. Thank you very much. Commissioner, um, I wanna commend you on, uh, on what you've done during, during the crisis and, um, and on what I, what I consider is an excellent plan for next steps. Um, I went through your memo um, that you submitted yesterday, and my only question, my only comment is that your last bullet point um, talk commits to giving partners and, and clients am ample notice of any changes uh, to policy. Um, I would like you to add the legislature to the list of people who are kept informed of where you're going, because uh, we would like to know what's going on. We're going to hear from our constituents, and um, it's always nicer to hear from you than in the news. Glad to do that. I appreciate the compliment also. And let me be clear that it's not me who deserves that. It's it's people like Jeffrey Pippinger and um, uh, um, Sean Brown, our deputy commissioner for economic services division. Um, and um, uh, uh, Sarah and others in OEO who have done a tremendous amount of work uh, along with our community providers. So it really has been a team effort. Thank you. And we will keep the legislature informed. Representative Gonzalez. Thank you so much. Uh, so just to be clear in terms of the, the path moving forward and new cases and new folks that need housing and how uh, I've heard very loud and clear that there is no plan to immediately kick people out. However, just thinking about that um, in the short term, I heard lots of long-term plans and thinking about the different ways that um, you're gonna uh, that you're proposing to accommodate and make changes that we've needed regardless of this crisis and that it's an opportunity to do so, but just wanted to, to make sure that I have clarity on what you're thinking for folks in the next three months who are new cases and have, have a need for a hotel room. We're still gonna to wanna to provide shelter to people who are homeless. Um, and so again, over time, as we, um, do figure out an appropriate way to reinvigorate our shelter system and also create alternative sites. We'll, the, the bottom line is if people are homeless, we want to provide them with shelter. That's not going to change. Um, and, and so we're certainly not going to close any doors. Great. And then I have a, um, a an additional question that's not a follow up to that, um, but I appreciate that clarity. Um, last time that um, you were with us, I asked about translation services and, and um, specifically folks that are uh, precariously housed that are farm workers and, and potentially need to have greater social distancing to, for their own health and others. Uh, and then also generally translation services and, and wondering if you've given either of those two issues any more um, thought or work towards. So I, I will have to get back to you specifically, and, and um, I don't know, I know we've talked about it, I did appreciate your question, uh, and we've certainly talked about it, 
and I'll check in to determine and I'll get back to you directly about what services are being provided. Although I will also add that one of the things that I'm looking uh, to looking at some of the national information with respect to uh, the population we're serving, it will be interesting to see uh, what portion of the population here in Vermont um, does uh, have English as a new language, uh, what percentage are people of color, new Americans to understand as we try to address needs of the homeless population, where does some of those other issues fit in? So thank you for asking. I look forward to hearing that, thank you. And Representative Hengo. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, the last time you were in, I asked a little bit about this, but you just brought up the um, general assistance program. Um, the restructuring of the emergency solutions grant that was pushed off um, timeline to April 2021, I think. Are you still thinking of going to that model in light of everything that's changing right now? So the fiscal year 21 budget proposal, as you indicated, did include a proposal to restructure the emergency housing program. I don't know what's going on with the fiscal year 21 budget, to be straightforward about it. But with respect to the community's role in implementing um, an approach to address emergency housing, the plan that we're talking about is actually consistent with the approach of giving communities um, resources and flexibility to address the needs of homeless in their communities. So it may look a little differently because the emergency housing program may look very different as we go forward. So the, the, the perspective of giving communities um, flexibility and resources is very much still in our minds. So if I can follow up, thank you for that. Um, I'm trying to envision this in my mind. Perhaps the state somehow purchases a property, for instance, and it resides in, let's say, the community of South Burlington because Representative Kalaki um, reminds us that the Holiday Inn is vacant now or will be soon. So then the community partners in South Burlington would then administer the program that's going to reside in that now state-owned, for instance, I'm, I'm conjecturing state-owned Holiday Inn property. So that's one potential model. Another potential model is actually, it's not the state that buys or purchases the property, but it is a local housing provider or a housing entity in a community that buys or leases a property like that. And the state's role is to provide the funding to help support that effort. And so it's not a state run facility. Okay, so to, just to follow up very briefly, so then the state would, um, send in the mental health workers and provide for their salaries and other community support type folks? Again, our system is actually not so much state provision of those services. And I know that Mary Moulton is, is uh, it, uh, it, on the um, Zoom lens here, so she's much more knowledgeable than me, but we have a designated agency system where the state yeah. provides resources to designated agencies who provide those services. It's not actually state employees who do that. But that's, I mean, I do appreciate the questions because that is part of this conversation mm -hmm. to go forward to figure out which roles are served directly by state uh, entities or employees and which ones are more community-based. And, and that is uh, really important to think about with respect to addressing the needs of homeless persons in our communities. Thank you, that's great. That closed the loop for me. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Sorry, Mary, I sort of pushed that over to you, but I know you will handle it very well. <laughs> Um, I, okay, Commissioner, it is according to my clock five mm -hmm. of, so I want you to take off and to go to your next spot. Um, Jeffrey, I wanted to ask you a very question. I just want to be mindful of the time. It's almost one o'clock and we still have, I still would like to hear from Mary and from Earhart and from, um, we have Stephen Whitaker also who wanted to share some thoughts. Jeffrey, are you here to listen? Do you have more to share um, before we get to Mary? You can unmute yourself there. Yeah. I uh, I will be here for the duration. 
Um, my only uh, addition uh, would thank you for the invitation to comment. And, and thank um, you, and thank you, Ken. Please feel free to. We'll treat Jeffrey. We'll we'll treat Jeffrey well. Thank you. I appreciate that. I am going to sign off. Thank you all. Bye now. Oh. And um, the thought that I had, Representative Stevens, was simply that um, a, a couple of very brief things. One is that, um, and I know that you've heard this in many different ways over the last week from different folks, but I do think that we have an opportunity here um, to really look going forward and not just default to returning to how we've always done things. Um, these sorts of opportunities come around very infrequently. And so to be able to capitalize on the crisis, not to be so crass, but to be able to re-envision things and how we deliver services to folks is, is critical. While we are thinking about those strategies, those short, medium, and long-term strategies, I think it's also imperative that we, that we do that in a very thoughtful way and in conversation with various partners within state government and outside of state government, because we don't want to have a crisis, like knee-jerk response in the recovery that then hamstrings us down the road, right? That we're stuck with a certain model that might have been expedient, but is not what we know is best practice. And then the last piece that I would say is just that, and I think that you've heard this before uh, this week as well, is that we don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel in terms of planning and conversations about you know what's best because we know what the evidence-based practices are. We have the roadmap. We have other uh, efforts in terms of planning. Of the call and emailed me. No, and that's fair enough. And I think that um, I think from my perspective, a little bit is is you know what opportunities can we take advantage of. But I'm also wary of saying, well, if we make these, and I, this may dovetail with what you were saying, is that, is that in the end, we have to be able to afford going down the line. Um, you know, there's the infamous case of the, the swimming pool at White River. It was a gift to the community, but it ended up, co it cost the community every year because they have to provide those services. Um, and I know that the administration has expressed that kind of wariness. Also, like what money can be used from the CARES Act or any other money that could be used for these purposes. So it's a lot of thinking and a lot of sorting out. I think we have answers to a large degree, but it's going to be implementing them or coming to, you know, deciding what we can do. So thank you for coming and thank you for, you know, just, and if you do have um, comments that you want to make, please feel free to raise your hand um, throughout the, the, the rest of the meeting. We'd appreciate it. Um, Thank you very so, much. I appreciate that. And I'll pop over to Mary Moulton. Um, Mary is um, with the Washington County Mental Health Service. Mary served within the government for years and years um, and without the government throughout the, in, with Washington County. Um, Mary, we heard um, just through the grapevine, this was over two weeks ago now, that uh, on one hand, um, there's been a, because people have been housed, and people have been some of the most fragile folks in, in Vermont. They, they're not utilizing some of the emergency psych services that they had pr prior, but that's not the end of the story. And I just wanted to, you know, wanted you to share what the, what you've seen and then what you can what you see in the near future um, to help us with our planning. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Stevens. So for the record, I'm Mary Moulton. Um, the executive director at Washington County, and um, really appreciate being able to come and talk to this subject. Um, what I heard from Ken was really reassuring, frankly. I think we are um, actually singing the same tune, and uh, in putting my testimony together for today, you'll hear some of the same strains, I think, from our region around thoughts we have for putting uh, short, mid, and long-term solutions in place that are somewhat in line. So what, what I will talk about absolutely in answer to your question um, is uh, our experience. And um, I am speaking when I say our, of a really great group of community providers. Uh, Washington County Mental Health is only one of many that have come together to work on this in our region. And we're really, um, very uh, uh, united in uh, developing homeless uh, housing solutions for people who are homeless. So 
Uh, we were in this from the beginning in providing services from Washington County Mental Health and, um, and providing uh, services through capstone and food um, and talking about what our solutions might be going forward. Um, but uh, in getting people into the hotels, there was certainly um, a surge there within the hotels. And with that, um, we learned a lot about what we would need to do go going forward. And so uh, with moving the shelter, the Good Samaritan shelter to the Econo Lodge, where people had individual rooms and some of them going to the hilltop in Berlin um, with other folks that were not involved in the shelter, what we learned there was that there really is a, a need for, um, for some kind of understanding around ground rules and expectations on, upon occupancy. Um, it wasn't all pretty, that's for sure. And we wouldn't expect it to be. So um, we uh, have been fortunate uh, in the last month uh, working with the state to get some security on site in those regions. Uh, in those areas. And uh, where we have the shelter, we have 24 seven staff, we have support there, we have mental health that goes there and, and offers up services during the day, just as present for people to come out and talk and for, get some support if they, if they want it. Um, and at the Hilltop now there is security. There have been, um, uh, there have been some unfortunate incidents there around, uh, you know, assault and, um, you know, uh, drug dealing. And um, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of rumor mill around what goes on up there. But um, overall, I mean, I think I note here that, you know, Sue Minter, who is the executive director of Capstone had said to me, Mary, do you think that the fact that we housed and fed these people kept them out of the hospital. Now that's something we have, you know, we're asking ourselves. And I said, well, that's a variable. And there are a lot of people working on that, but I thought about it a little bit. And I think having been a crisis responder and my background uh, in crisis management, what we know about uh, when there's a major event and a disaster is that people really comply for a time and they settle down and there's a lull. And so, yes, we housed people and we gave them food and brought them in and they felt safe and they were brought in out of the elements. And we have learned so much from this experience that overall it was a very good thing that we did it. Um, and uh, then now you, you, know, you kind of put the general stress that people have on that in any disaster and then you put COVID-19 over it and over time, you begin to see situations pop. And so now we are seeing people come into the ER and they are, um, they are expressing, these are people who live in the settings of the hotels that they're feeling a lot of stress, that, um, that you know, they, they can't, they really want a housing solution soon, that they really need more support. Uh, we had three people come into the weekend, into the ER over the weekend whose anxiety level was high, whose fear level was high. There's, there's um, you know, there, there's uh, noise at the hotel. There's a lot going on there that they're very afraid of. So, um, you know, I, there is security at now at the Hilltop and that is extremely helpful even coming into the building. I think we're getting a handle on it. That's the good news. I really think we're getting a better handle on it. But in any of these situations, you're going to have people come in who you know, our perpetrators and those who are victims. And that's what we have to be present for to help mitigate when we take the responsibility of bringing folks in like this. So we learned that and um, just wanted to share with you a few statistics around how this has affects, affects us all because, you know, our having to shelter in place, let's face it, I'm looking at you all in your, your homes or your offices and um, you know, having been told that we must stay in these places uh, makes it more stressful and for some distressful. So um, during this time, we have had in the United States, 45% of the adult population say that the pandemic has affected their mental health, 45%. And 19% say that it has had a major impact on them. 
Um, that's from a Kaiser Family Foundation pool. Express Scripts, which is a uh, software for all psychiatric prescriptions, reports that between February and March, its tracking mechanisms for prescription showed a spike for anti-anxiety medication of 34%, 34%, 18.6% for antidepressants, 14.8% for anti-insomnia medications. I've talked to a lot of people who are, you know, taking melatonin to help themselves get to sleep. Um, and uh, Nielsen polls reported that alcohol sales went up 55% in the first two weeks of March. So my point is that within the general population, this is happening. And then we have specialized subsets of folks um, that are having even harder times. And these are some of the folks that we are trying to help within the shelters. So what we want to do is move toward healthy living situations um, where we are moving folks out of the hotels in a thoughtful fashion based on what we have learned so that we can get them the proper supports. And in our region, we are really solidly thinking about that and how we do it. Um, so we've thought about short, mid and long-term solutions. And what I would share with you is our numbers here, as well as our thoughts, which again, align very much with um, Commissioner Schatz. Um, for short-term um, securing temporary housing, we, we think of it as securing temporary housing and safety. And we were very worried about that May 15th date. So a little more relaxed about that, knowing that that's not going to be a, you must leave hard stop. Um, you must leave the hotel. But um, we were looking towards some level of single room occupancy units for shelter guests currently housed at the Econo Lodge in Montpelier with the small spillover at the Hilltop. And um, our shelter director had uh, been uh, very clear that he wanted to continue 24 seven, of course, uh, on-site supports. And those are now awake on-site supports, by the way, they used to sleep at night, no longer, they're awake. Um, and we as a mental health agency have provided folks there with training on how to assist people having a difficult time as well. So, um, and, and we could look at one representative had that idea around, uh, I think it was you, Tommy, maybe the colleges. So we're look a college with open suites or rooms might be a consideration for stepping down the Econo Lodge in the short term, if we must move ourselves back. Um, we have 147 households here in central Vermont without children living in hotels. Uh, there are 236 pe people total. We, uh, within the 236 are 44 children living with their parents in hotels. We know currently that there are 93 households with no income except $53 of monthly GA and uh, 46 have SSI, SSDI, Social Security, and there's a number with no benefits at all. So, um, so our region is applying for two uh, HOP grants, housing opportunity grants. Uh, one is to help the shelter with this movement and to pay for what we might need to do. Uh, moving folks, perhaps, again, perhaps, um, I want to stay in my lane too, to a, to a college uh, dorm situation or suite situation. Another is to go back to the shelter the two shelters and reduce that footprint because we know that it can't be as big as it was. So when the time comes bringing a smaller group back there um, within one of the HOP grants, um, hiring another case manager who can work with finding people more permanent housing solutions. Um, we have found that those folks are absolutely key to helping people maneuver the system. They're, they're miracle workers. Uh, maintaining the housing vouchers, um, yes, please, in spite of all the good, the bad, the ugly, um, we, we need some more time. And we absolutely, Jeffrey, I couldn't agree with you more, find this an incredible opportunity for ourselves. We actually know uh, who these folks are because we are doing outreach and assessments to every, every single room um, currently between Capstone and Washington County Mental Health. Um, we have a mental health health clinician, clinician, as I said, for consultation. Um, we are able to mitigate situations where people are having a difficult time thinking they might need to go to the ER, get them into a, a, an emergency appointment. We're doing that. 
Um, so we want to we want to continue with those supports, prioritizing families with children for permanent housing with vouchers, and we need more vouchers. Um, and we also realize some people will go back outside. Um, we think in our region here, we didn't have everyone come in. Um, we do have street outreach team. We think there's 10 to 15 people who are still out. And if those are folks are going to leave the hotels and go back out, we 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 realize we need a little budget to help them to have proper equipment um, and uh, to keep warm and safe outside. Um, Midterm, um, we kind of typify this area as securing funding, planning, and available housing. So we move toward that. We hope, we hope there'd be an extension of existing hotel housing vouchers. And I think that's probably the, um, what did Ken refer to that for? Um, that's the, uh, maybe the eviction um, prevention piece um, where we really want to see people who face eviction uh, be able to have that taken up off their off their plate and certainly ours as a community we do not want to add to the numbers I just gave you more people I think we all we all understand that so you know an example we have we have we have and we also want more flexibility continued flexibility with being able to help people to solve their problems and not just go toward eviction and then start that cycle and not be able to get back in to get housing. Right now, we were working with a mom who has four children and she's uh, kind of blown it in, in the area of reach up requirements, but she's back engaged yet she is way behind in her rent. Um, if we can't get dollars for her, you know, she might lose her housing. And we, she's re-engaged with case management. So we're, we're just trying to get things back on track and would like to have some continued flexibility to help her. Um, more project-based vouchers within the state, affordable housing system. And then of course, you know, the commissioner mentioned this, just locating housing stock. We need affordable housing stock and additional dollars that enhance dollar to meet the rent that's falling just outside of price range. And we've talked about this a lot. Um, Ken mentioned this a bundle of money for repairs um, to help landlords um, to fix things, to open up their units. They've closed units to us. And um, so we need to open those back up. And if we could assure them, um, in some cases we can because we have bundles of money, but we need more in our region that um, we could um, have money for repairs in case there's something that's destroyed within their units, it would be very, very helpful. We're working with a, a Washington County's very invested. We are very invested at, at uh, within mental health at developing housing stock for folks, because we believe that if people are housed overall with the supports that they need, uh, it, it just helps their mental health, gets them back on track, helps their health, we all know that. So uh, we're helping a, a new land landowner, a uh, young fella who really wants to uh, fix up a house and we're trying to get some money out to him to develop an SRO, put in a peer support uh, person. I can't say enough about peer supports as supports within some of these, um, I would call them maybe progressive housing models where we could think forward to, and, and we run some of these at Washington County Mental Health, you know, there's someone on site 24-7, um, but then there's also individual apartments. And so you might need that on-site single room occupancy. And then next to that might be an apartment that is independent. And um, we have one of these in Waterbury where we have six units and one is 24 seven wrap. And then people live independently because um, they do better and they wanna live independently, but they also find it helpful to just be able to reach back. And then after a couple of years, they're out on their own, which is great. That's what we hope for them. Um, Long-term, just securing permanent housing for all. And that's, that's the apartment or small dwelling, single units, double units, um, families. Uh, the 44 kids that we have living in hotels should be a priority, as I said. Um, the um, a tiny house idea, I think Eileen Peltier, who's testified before you, calls them now the tiny tiny mite houses or something like that. Um, but we have that, we have people uh, in our one and then a peer support program next door. We're housing uh, three people now and um, they are very, it's very successful. The, the uh, 
the tiny house mini project at this point in time is a very successful and these are hard to house chronic homeless folks. So doing very well with a peer support piece. Um, we should, I think, continue to look at whether we could do more of that in a mixed community setting. Um, essentially, uh, we're looking to be creative and look for flexibility and financing. Um, I was one who came to you and talked about the emergency solutions grant with a level of skepticism. Um, I think that my concern uh, is mainly around, will we have enough dollars to do what we need and will we be supported um, by the state with those needs? And so, you know, this, this whole pandemic has in fact kind of pushed some of that a bit. And I think um, maybe because there are federal dollars come in, coming in, it will be more hopeful to find the dollars, I'm not sure. Um, but if we have to put someone in for additional um, supports, we do need additional money within our budget to do that. So uh, we have to get those dollars from the Department of Health um, or from some other entity. The region uh, where we work together through our Accountable Community for Health, which is called Thrive in our region, uh, on this particular homeless issue, we are looking to go forward with a very similar thought process as what was expressed by Commissioner uh, Schatz, putting our heads together if we can find the dollars. Um, we have a lot of will. We need the flexibility. We need the dollars. Um, we've got the creativity and the willpower. So um, with that, I think we, we'll, we, I just wanna thank you for the support you'll give on this and to assure you we'll be putting these thoughts into a letter, which will go next week to the secretary Terry as well, outlining what um, what a lot of what I've just spoke to you about. So I'll close at this point. That's great, Mary. Thank you. And I think what we'll do is is move on to Richard. And, and if you were going to be here, then we'll we'll save questions for you for the end, if we okay. have them. Um, and I believe that um, Eileen referred to them as tiny mighty houses or tiny mighty houses. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So um, Richard Williams is here. Uh, Richard uh, has, has testified before our committee before he's uh, the executive director of the Vermont Housing State Housing Authority, which controls the Section 8 vouchers and also helps manage the statewide vouchers, which were developed over the last 10 years since. Um, and this is Richard, this is kind of where I want you to just give us a quick little background on the ideas that were um, that happened ten, starting 10 years ago and how it affects us now, which is when the state of Vermont lost 900 to 1,000 Section 8 vouchers. Um, so maybe if you can give us an idea of what the numbers were, how many we've reclaimed and what it means moving forward in terms of developing or adding more capacity to the statewide program that already exists. Thank you. Good afternoon, representatives. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Stevens, for the opportunity to testify before your committee here today. Um, the uh, <clears throat> some of the, uh, the part of your introduction, uh, Mr. Chairman, was you know, I've been in this business for uh, forty-six years, and I've you know uh, was involved with the uh, Department of Mental Health uh, many many years ago. Uh, more than I would care to even think about, uh, about, de about uh, developing a bridge program that actually, you know, got people from a temporary uh, small assistance that Department of Mental Health was providing to get over to the uh, federal Section 8. Back then we called it certificate program, now we call it the voucher program. Um, so that was an initiative in the state, you know, going way, way back. And, uh, and then of course, now the Vermont rental subsidy program that many folks and including Mary and Earhart that are on here today um, and others were very responsible uh, and with the uh, generous support of the uh, Vermont legislature to fund the program, uh, I think has been very successful. Uh, as uh, you've heard some a good testimony already, and, and you'll certainly hear more coming. Uh, 
But uh, before you folks left town back in March 13th, I think it was, you know, the problem was uh, the problem that we were speaking to you back then, uh, pretty much the same problem, uh, talking about this three-legged stool, uh, that uh, approach, which is, you know, talks about the need for capital dollars, rental assistance, and basically wraparound uh, services uh, and more funding for you know, our community partners that actually provide uh, the services uh, to these vulnerable populations. You know, the pair, this pandemic thing is, you know, is probably the worst thing that most of us have ever experienced in our life. Um, but, it, it, but as other speakers have said, it's created some opportunities for us. I mean, we do this point in time count uh, every January and we all know it's flawed, um, but, it's, it is really the only method we have for, for guaranteeing or, you know, at least trying to, uh, trying to uh, put a number on what the homeless was. You know, the, uh, the number that uh, Commissioner Schatz threw out was, was 1,100. I'd be surprised if it was that low back then, but, uh, uh, but the way that count works is, is I don't have the Chittenden County numbers yet. I just have some rough da data on what they call balance of state. And these are numbers that are, are just one night only with, for, with adverse weather conditions in all counties. And, and those that, who have not already secured other resources. Uh, and so this does include the couch surfing, the doubled up uh, or, or for some paying for their own hotel or, or having a friend or a family pay for it. Uh, um, the 1800 that's been number has been used today, uh, currently in hotels and motels is an extremely relaxed qualification in comparison to the point in time count. Uh, as I said, I would be surprised that it's only 1100 because that would, that would be only 11 more than last year's number. And we've seen, and the, the rough data I've seen as far as balance of state, there's about an 80 person increased. Uh, so that doesn't include, uh, Chittenden County. So. This year, our balance of state looks to appear to be around 861 last year with 780. Um, that uh, some of those uh, subpopulations here that included households with children of uh, 102 households had kids. Um, there was uh, 787 sheltered, 76 unsheltered. The chronically homeless households uh, was uh, 100 last year. This year, it looks like it's 139. Include veterans, 68 veterans, 276 uh, mental health, uh, 181 substance use disorder, uh, fleeing domestic violence, uh, 108 youth, uh, which is 24 and under, including parenting with children, was 68. So. That's, that's the numbers that we were looking at at, at a one point in time in, in January. So the opportunity we have here now is that we uh, uh, have a, you know, a really good count on what the, what the uh, homeless uh, is in Vermont. It, uh, it, it is obviously very terrible times that we're in, but it also provides you know, great opportunities here uh, to try to develop um, a system, you know, working with the legislature, working with the administration to really drill down on this. We know where folks are and the, you've heard about the coordinated entry uh, program. Uh, this is a great opportunity to get those folks into the system and to, uh, to drill down on what their needs are and to uh, try moving away from you know, it's, I think I heard someone testify, I think maybe it actually was Gus Selig, uh, you know, he's, I believe, started with uh, the, the Community Action Agency in Barrie in 1977. I started for Vermont State Housing Authority in 1974. So uh, we're some of the older folks that have been around. Uh, but as Gus said, there wasn't any shelters back then. Uh, so you can see what has happened, you know, in, in the time since then, you know, we've developed uh, alternatives to permanent housing. And uh, I have never been a, a, a fan of transitional housing or shelters, uh, but it's become a, 
I don't know if I should use this, but sort of a necessary evil. Uh, that's how we, we needed to come up with, you know, solutions to try to help folks that had no housing. And so that's how we sort of got there. Uh, as we see through this, in the last six to eight weeks, uh, you know, these congregate facilities are not, not a good place, not a healthy place for people to be living. And uh, so we need to do better, uh, but it's gonna take a lot of money. And uh, there's an opportunity for money. There's lots of there's some monies on the table now, and uh, working with the administration and the uh, in the legislature, I, I think there's there's some uh, systems that can be developed. You know, working with the community partners uh, to help these households. Uh, we're not going to do it with federal dollars because uh, I did an inventory of what we possibly could. Could uh, you know if we develop you know just targeted all the vouchers that we currently have now is that you know we only have probably maybe 150 vouchers that we could come up with now possibly uh, and that's far short of you know the 1,800 folks that are living in the, in the in the shelters um, or excuse me living in the hotels so there are some vacancies out there we've heard people talk about that uh, but. Uh, uh, with that, there will have to come rental assistance, you know, uh, to support uh, support the paying the rent. And there's also going to be a need for strong support services, as as Mary mentioned, you know, with just with some of her experience in the last few weeks, uh, putting uh, a lot of folks into an area, uh, has just demonstrated that, in my opinion, that how much we need the support. Of our community partners out there to to provide these these services. So basically, what it costs the uh, through our program that we administer, we spend approximately about eight thousand dollars a year annually for for rental subsidy to support someone that's living in a Section Eight Housing cho Choice voucher unit. So if you were to uh, Think that you could support say 1500 households uh hang on your seats here it comes about 12 million dollars worth of rental subsidies and that's just only for a year as the commissioner said that many of these folks are going to, you know there's different uh will be different uh scenarios for each and every one of the folks but many are going to continue to need uh, long-term subsidies. Uh, as you heard from Mary, most of these folks have no income. So that in the, in the way the federal program works is the federal government pays more. There's always a, a the average right now for our program is about $650 is what our housing assistance payment is, but that takes into consideration all our units. We have about uh, uh, over 4,000 units under that particular program. So that's averaged across and so that includes, you know, folks that are working, you know, so the difference between that and what the a fair market rent would be for that particular unit is made up through the tenant contribution. So that and I would anticipate we're going to be paying pretty much close to 100% for many of these folks uh, for rental subsidies. There are, uh, there is, there's a limited number of uh, of uh, units out there that are vacant. Uh, I, I don't, there's definitely not enough. Uh, so as, as the commissioner mentioned that, you know, long-term uh, there needs to be a development of new affordable permanent housing. Uh, it's, there's lots of people have talked about a lot of different uh, options, you know, tiny homes and filling up mobile home uh, lots and mobile home parks, you know, that, that that's something that could be done fairly quickly. There's, there's a fair amount of vacancies in mobile home parks. I could see where, you know, uh, there could be some acquisition of mobile homes and placed on these lots. Uh, we've, we've heard about the motels, uh, you know, the, uh, the whole motel thing has really been, you know, pretty devastated. I would think with this uh, with this virus, I would think that the ones that are on the edge, uh, this will probably uh, you know close their doors. So there may be some opportunities, but again, as you've heard from other speakers, is that I've lived through some of these failed uh, 
failed tries by the federal government. Uh, and uh, we all can probably think of one or two uh, around the United States uh, where just too many people are, are housed in one building. You know, it's, uh, we, we gotta be very careful and I know nobody wants to do that, but we need to be very careful that, uh, you know, uh, to support a mixed income uh, environment for these folks. We just don't want to put uh, everybody, you know, as, as Mary said, you know, uh, some of the challenges that they have faced with working with the hotels and the population, you know, uh, putting too many people in one place uh, creates issues. So I think, no, and I know nobody wants to do that. Certainly nobody in your committee or nobody out here in the uh, affordable housing community would like to, wants to do that, but there are options. And uh, I think everything's on the table right now. Uh, it's like I said, it's a terrible time that we're living in, but it, but what a great opportunity. I mean, you know, Earhart's been in this business as, probably as long as I have. And, you know, we've been talking about trying to come up with solutions, you know, for all these years and, you know, and it's here, it's right before us, it's on our plate. Um, if, you know, this is, if we can't do something now, we never will be able to do that. So uh, I haven't got many more years left in this business, but, you know, I would certainly like to see, uh, you know, the support that's behind this right now is, uh, is uh, something we need to see continue, you know. So, you know, we've got the short term goals, you know, as to how to deal with the uh, with this population, and you know, I don't. I I heard a, a pretty large number of what it costs to support people in in the uh, in the uh, motels. In I don't know if it's an accurate number or not. Basis, it's. I heard that uh, it was approximately three million dollars. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, um, so I think that we can take this money and we can redirect it, and uh, but it's going to need the support. You know, not just this year. And you know, when the federal money goes away at the end of December, it's it's going to take a lot of support from our own state legislature uh, to appropriate the money to keep these these programs going. But the problem's just going to get worse because of all the lost lost jobs. So we've got a lot of people out there that if they're not homeless, they're not far from it, and uh, it's you know losing your you know it's. How, how quick do we get our economy back up and running? I don't see that happening soon. So uh, I think there's gonna be more and more people looking for help. And uh, you know, and that's what's really scary is that we know what the population is now and, but we really don't know what it's gonna look like, you know, in 60, 90 days or longer, you know, because, uh, you know, people are getting some support now, but uh, how long would that continue? Richard, um, a quick question is for clarification. Um, and I think, I'm not sure if you used the phrase, but or, or if Mary used the phrase about, um, just a reminder about project-based vouchers versus the individual vouchers. Now, I believe all of our state issued vouchers are individual vouchers and we have project-based vouchers for something that was much more in vogue 30 years ago than it is now, but they are what helps make some of this housing stable because, because an individual may qualify for a voucher and then they have to find a place to live and a landlord to, to, to find it. But then if they move or including moving out of state, they can take that voucher with them as long as they still qualify. Is that, are those still the same, same rules or same definitions of the, of the vouchers? Yeah, the, uh, you know, that uh, the voucher is a portable voucher uh, and it's not uh, just not limited to the state of Vermont, but you mentioned family unification, uh, excuse me, you, you mentioned the project based voucher program and uh, that is created. It's not like it's a new allocation or anything of, of vouchers. What we do is we use our normal allocation of Section 8 housing choice vouchers uh, and we can make those into project based vouchers and we can enter into up to 20 year contracts. In fact, today we just released, and it's up on our website, uh, uh, we're funding 12 affordable housing projects uh, that uh, just went through a, a recent uh, competition, which is about $842,000 annually in our Section 8 program uh, budget authority. Uh, so that's, is, uh, it's, uh, I think it's, 
around 12 different different projects throughout the state. So that, that will be long-term permanent affordable housing. Uh, some of those went to private developer, uh, developers, and but the majority of them went to nonprofit developers. So. That's great. Um, I so see that, that. So you mentioned something about project-based, uh, you know, I, I, there has been some uh, conversation and maybe Jeff, Jeffrey wants to jump in or not, but I think there was an opportunity to do project-based uh, subsidies through the Vermont rental subsidy program, but it's going to take a guarantee. And, you know, typically that's hard for legislature to make those guarantees going forward that, you know, forward funding of a program. But uh, I think that's an option too. Uh, and the project-based vouchers really, that's what it takes uh, to really get permanent affordable housing. Uh, that's what the developers are looking for. That's what, Many were using tax credits, either state tax credits or the uh, you know four percent or nine percent credits through Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Uh, but the project base is what brings that was capital dollars to the project because they know that those units are going to be uh, occupied. They know that there is going to be at least uh, eighty percent or more of that uh, housing assistance payment will be paid. Uh, in our in the case of the uh, the project based voucher is the federal government, but in this case, it could be the state of Vermont. Okay. Um, Representative Triano. Yes, I just, you know, I mean, uh, Ken, I think it was that mentioned that um, some of the disastrous uh, housing projects of the past, and, you know, after working in St. Johnsbury for 40 years, I, I recall what used to be known as Moonlight Ridge built far enough out of town so that you couldn't walk into downtown. There was no services or facilities around it. Um, and it, you know, it was a disaster. I mean, it's, it maintains, it still happens, but I mean, it was that based on an idea that people who need services should be close together in order to consolidate the services that they need. Uh, you know, I, I, I just, I could never quite figure out how that bad idea happened, I guess. <laughs> Well, Representative Triano, you're absolutely correct. And we were involved with that project when I first started in, in housing in 1974. And uh, I mean, I think the first time I was up there, there was a deer hanging out the window. I, I complimented the gentleman on his, uh, it was a nice, uh, nice buck, but I suggested that might not be the best place to be hanging it is out of his apartment window. So we also had uh, uh, New Avenue Apartments yeah. Uh, which has been a challenge for uh, St. Johnsbury, another flawed program, but uh, that was the biggest challenge for that was an out of state uh, owner developer of that project. And there was no stewardship over that. Uh, we had many challenges with that property, but we wanted to keep the rental assistance in place on it as even with the challenges we had with that particular owner and developer, uh, and now that's going to be under great new stewardship. Once we can get the, get the construction crews back in there again, uh, that's going to be housing that, you know, town of St. Johnsbury can be very proud of, you know, yes. I mean, mo most appropriate as a downtown, <clears throat> as a downtown de uh, development piece, um, is, is of great interest. And I think that it will happen. I think that, you know, in the, I, I, I watched from my office window for a number of years, um, the various owners go through and make a valiant attempt at trying to fix a, you know, a hundred year old furnace and keep everyone warm and uh, um, uh, rid the bed bugs from there and, and, and such. So <clears throat> I have great uh, hope for uh, this new project. <clears throat> and I think it is much more appropriate for what we're trying to deal with as far as, um, you know, low, moderate income uh, in a, in a, uh, even in rural communities, but in the community rather than outside the community. Um, and I, I noted that vouchers are being transferred so that um, those who are displaced as a result of this project uh, will be able to come back if they, so, uh, if they want to and, uh, <clears throat> and use those, reuse those vouchers. So I thought the whole thing just really came together well and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, revitalizing downtown, both with jobs, um, you know, uh, apartments and, and the commercial space, which is all empty right now and um, has been unable to uh, to be rented because, again, you know, just uh, water and sewer problems and uh, heating problems. So, um, you know, it, it 
it's well needed in St. Johnsburg. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. You know, I think anytime you saw any flurry of activity over there, it's probably after a threat from my office of terminating a housing <laughs> assistance payment contract. And uh, that usually got their attention. But, uh, you know, now, you know, Rural Edge is involved with that. Housing Vermont's involved with that. Uh, they're going to have private management uh, once that gets up and running. You know, we, we worked with all the residents to help relocate, find them housing. Uh, as you said, they can come back if they choose to, um, you know, or if not, but it, it's still, there will be project-based vouchers for that. Uh, and I really think in getting that commercial space back back available, of course, you know, we're, we're a whole different times now, but it, you know, it's how, how are we gonna, you know, you know, support our downtown businesses that we have already and at the same time create more, but it's such a great opportunity for you know, some other retail space there that's just, uh, you know, just basically it's been boarded up. It's been an eyesore. I hated to drive yeah. by that building, you know, and I couldn't 12, imagine 12 you folks empty, living in the community. So yeah, 12 empty uh, commercial spaces uh, just in the two blocks of downtown. And you didn't want to go in that Chinese restaurant because they, when they walked away from it, they just left it the way it was. So not a, not a pretty sight. But no, I, I think it's a good point, uh, Representative, is that, you know, it is critical to wherever this housing is built, that it has access to services and not to overtax the, the folks that are providing the services as well, because, you know, every, you know, rural Vermont or Northeast Kingdom, you know, their capacity is much different than, you know, you know, some of these, you know, service agencies that are operating in Chittenden County. So, you know, and so wherever it's, wherever this is going to be, you know, housing is going to be built, the supports need to be there and, you know, supports come in the way of dollars. Uh, and that's how, you know, folks are able to support the staff uh, that are really doing just unbelievable things out there working with, with the, the vulnerable population we're talking about here. All right, thank you. I, we were expecting another witness and we're, I'm gonna give him a little bit of leeway. Um, Stephen Whitaker, who you may know, wanted to testify. He provided us with, um, he provided us with some uh, information that is on our website right now, um, but he is, I'm going to give him a couple minutes to, to see if he, he was listening in on the YouTube. And so Stephen, if you are available, please um, request to come into the meeting. Um, so while we're waiting, uh, Jeffrey, do you have anything that you want to share at this point from what you've been hearing? No? Okay. I mean, it, it, you know the the breadth of the problem or the the breadth of the possible solutions is just so it is so big i mean Earhart is here but i've asked him to come back on tuesday to not only talk about um issues that are directed directly related to the to the work that he's provided us but he has also been on top of the federal funding and trying to get an idea as much as anybody else has to try to get an idea of, of how the money can be spent, what's actually coming to Vermont through small state minimums as he's discussed before, but also perhaps we'll have some ideas about what the larger CARE Act is about um, for us. But also uh, I would like to, and Earhart also advocates at times for pathways We've heard from Maura Collins, who's the chair of the board. And we've also heard in the past earlier this year from Hillary Melton, who is the executive director of Pathways. We had, they had asked us for support for the expansion of Pathways into more, uh, I believe it was gonna be uh, $900,000 was the request this year to expand it to two more counties, Rutland and perhaps Bennington County. And the pathways model is what we were, it, the, the housing first model, I don't think those phrase, that phrase was used by the commissioner, but when we're talking about what's the fastest we can get to, um, to the getting these services out to people, pathways has shown that between the housing and the service, the wraparound services that it's been very effective and cost effective as well. Um, I'm going to, is this Steven? Yes, I'm here. All right, um, so I'm gonna, um, uh, Stephen, I trust you've been listening. Um, we, it's 1.45 now, we're gonna try to end as close to two o'clock as we can today, but I wanted to give you, you have, you've been expressing to me offline the, the desire to weigh in on what you see, at least here in central Vermont, as some of the, some of the important issues 
um, from from the folks that you know and from what so I just wanted to be able to give you an opportunity to share your thoughts with us we see we've seen um, or we know that there's material that you provided us that's on our website right now but um, I just wanted to go ahead and pass the microphone to you if that's okay yeah that's fine thank you mr. chairman uh, Stephen Whitaker for the record uh, been living in central Vermont for 30 something years I've worked in on and off with affordable housing and energy efficiency for some decades before that. So, but I, I think uh, in timing uh, is appropriate. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. We, this uh, homeless support services system was broken before the pandemic. It's worse now, even as everyone is more tolerant out of necessity due to the pandemic. Uh, the complacency, the tolerance of the indignity. Even the cruel neglect is pervasive. Uh, and we hear this constant refrain of everyone's doing the best we can. Um, I suggest that I know some communities are doing what's called a sleep out uh, for the homeless, where the decision makers, the policy makers, the uh, public officials actually experience what it's like to live on the street. I've been an advocate for many issues, but specifically, I spent the last year working with the homeless population in uh, central Vermont. There were over 150 people uh, last summer uh, spread across outside of the shelters. Um, and you've heard of plenty of numbers now. Uh, but, you know, in order of priority, I just want to kind of ground this from the folks. There's a number of people who do not fit into the shelter system. Um, I, I just went and talked to four or five of them this morning uh, for various reasons. They're either they've been banned by Good Samaritan. Uh, they have they can't deal with that uh, control paradigm. Uh, anxiety issues over claustrophobia, whatever. But there's quite a few people who are not into the system. and that seems to be somewhat of an ignored population uh, and even more vulnerable than the ones who have hotel rooms right now. But the lack of integration between uh, local service providers and or even municipalities is, is astounding. And I've been arguing that this is a city government responsibility to keep an eye on this, to have a point person to know where the meals can or can't be had, uh, to keep bathrooms open. Uh, the city is our capital city in Montpelier, uh, shirks that responsibility, says we're not in the social services business, somebody else will take care of it. Now there is, there's a new you know county command center that is supposed to be taking care of it. And, it, and nothing could be further from the truth. In order of priority, the needs of these folks on the street is food, toilet, safety, privacy, showers, laundry, restful, deep sleep, as opposed to being roused on a bench somewhere uh, by every noise as a possible threat. Supplies, human trusting connections to you, other humans, and Almost facetiously, I put hope and plans and faith at the bottom, because by the time you get to the bottom of that list, there's very little left in many of these folks' uh, view of the world. Uh, there's, I was somewhat, I was, I was interested, but somewhat shocked at the nonchalant manner of the witness from uh, one of the White, R White River Valley shelters talking to the Senate Economic Development committee yesterday on the same topic, but talking about the, it's okay to put these lined up cots head to toe so they're not breathing in each other's faces. Yeah, they might be smelling each other's feet, but that that's acceptable? I mean, I, I beg to differ. Uh, many of these folks are angry and they're acting out as to be expected. Uh, some of their socialization skills have atrophied over time, too much time on the streets. And we hear this tired story that it's often their own fault. It's due to mental illness. The, the care, or more accurately, the neglect 
of our society for this population is causing mental distress. We're compounding the challenges and the future costs of reintegrating our brothers and sisters. So, yes, there are unfortunate circumstances, and it's a vicious cycle. Addiction, mental challenges, lack of job skills, reputation. But where is the transition plan? We, this is the real opportunity, and I am hopeful that we would seize the opportunity. But what I'm hearing sounds like more of the same, because our community partners are part of the problem. The, the complacency, the, uh, whew, the, state, the state approach. Uh, you, I, you hear it referred to the, the road to end, end, ending, ending homelessness, the roadmap to ending homelessness. And to me, it's a wish list for when a half a billion dollars becomes available. There's no specifics in how to make any progress in the meantime. To be holding out until there's enough money to build quarter million dollar apartments, uh, an unlimited supply of quarter million dollar apartments to put folks in, is is an absurd, is a, is a fairy tale. Uh, so, in, in Ms. Peltier's comments to uh, the committee last week was that. She's unaware of any substantial planning for this transition. And that's in her written four-page testimony to the Senate Economic Development Committee. That I find shocking because she's one of the co-commanders of our, you know, Washington, Northern Orange County, uh, you know, command center. But where where is the planning that's going to work in direct partnership with the folks on the street. This won't even work at a county level. This has to work at a municipal level where you're seeing the immediate needs, where you're taking care of the immediate needs and you you can't ignore it. At a county level, you can ignore it. I talked to someone who tried to enter the system, uh, found gets told from Barry Capstone, oh, well, we got a two week waiting period or more uh, so yeah, we'll schedule a couple weeks out to get you an eval if you sign away all your privacy rights and, and no, we won't come to Montpelier and meet you, uh, because we can't afford an office in Montpelier. I just found that, and I even raised that with, uh, Director Mentor, that that is so out of touch with third population. Third population doesn't plan two weeks ahead. They plan a day or two ahead. Uh, the idea that you can't get, have an appointment in Montpelier. Failure was just off the charts absurd. Uh, it's ima- it is naive to imagine that there will ever be enough housing stock to simply whisk anyone off the street and lodge them in an apartment with a private bath and kitchen. Vermont could very well end up attracting thousands of indigent folks from all over the country if we don't anticipate and create a plan for upward integration leading to productive reintegration to paid rental housing, and even tiny home ownership. Some of this will require, some few, hopefully few, will require ongoing transitional and supportive housing, not necessarily mental health supervision. So while the housing first model is important, we need to not wait until we build, rehab, or invest in very expensive, fully outfitted apartments and converted motels to single room occupancy. It's important to design a system in incremental steps for upward mobility that rewards initiative, that provides opportunity while it enables the dignity of work. I, I talk to folks today who don't want to work. They want to panhandle. They don't want to, you know, they want to have tiny house given to them. And I, I challenge them on that thought. You know, I asked his input and even to prepare my testimony. So we also need to accommodate travelers, both money tourists and the ind- indigent hikers and hitchhikers and panhandlers. We could offer a meal, a shower, an opportunity to make a few bucks to travel on, and a range of options for safe sleeping, from a hut or a pod to a motel voucher or a spare room in a supportive transitional home. Here's where the magic happens. Expert social engagement to assess those needs. What are this individual's needs? What do they have to offer? How long might they be in town? What opportunities for food, clothing, wash-up, a warm meal, a good night's rest? What else can we offer? There's no reason that this couldn't be part of the state-to-state campaign to get people to move to Vermont. 
we need to get off this idea that we're expecting these people to fail. And that's what I hear in most of the testimony today. We're going to have this chronic cycle of more and more subsidies perpetually and a, more and more subsidies for housing stock, creating more imp- uh, pressure on the rental market, creating h- higher rents, creating fewer people to afford them, and therefore greater need for subsidies. I think it's fundamentally misguided. We need to be investing in the individuals, both keeping the rents down and creating opportunity for people to pay the rent. So uh, our Econo Lodge is being run like a jail. I was uh, respectfully encouraged to leave the property last night. I went to talk to some of the folks that I know there, and I was met some one of the Good Samaritan uh, employees. There's a pair, pair of them there. They're running it like a jail. They've got it locked down. They see anybody on the property, they chase them down and say, you are not to be on the property. I found this note attached to the door. As a public safety measure, no member of the public is allowed in the building. Guests are not to open doors to those not served. Any violation of this rule is grounds for immediate room forfeiture. And they, I, upon querying, while the police officer was there trying to get rid of me on their behalf, uh, I said, "Let me call them." Oh no, you can't call the call the guests. We don't keep, we don't transfer any calls to their rooms. I'm like, "What the hell is going on?" I've sent some pictures of the food they're serving, both from MREs and Salvation Army meals with less than a handful of, you know, beans or pasta and a piece of white bread and a pat of butter. I mean. We have opportunity here with our merchants that have, are down right now to be preparing amazing food and delivering it to these. But we're not coordinated that way. We're, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little passionate about this. So the assumption is that you will fail rather than succeed. It's contaminating the soup. They're serving horrible food, MREs, no visitors, threat of forfeiture. There's a code of conduct that was not attached to the letter, which I was able to achieve as a result of a free public records request. The, the guests who are staying there have not been given a copy of the code of conduct that they are supposedly living within. It's not provided at the locations. Uh, there was one report of a guest saying one of the staff was brandishing a gun during one of the rides, uh, claiming to be an ATF agent. They removed the computers. There's no internet access, There's no telephone calls. Nope. I think I'm making the, enough of the point. So I believe our somewhat unaccountable nonprofit partners are spending large amount of funds from the state, and the state LEL office becomes a partner in protecting the legitimacy of those grants, not necessarily in opening up transparency into what happened. These nonprofits claim to not be subject to public records law. They don't reveal how they're spending their money. Good Samaritan is spending over half a million dollars plus other donations, and there's no transparency there at all. You know, it's uh, additionally staff, and because of the common board member or chair of the common board, uh, another way is the day center here in Montpelier, and we've got problems staffing. I've witnessed the staff there referring to the guests as worthless, hopeless you know, just the most grievous, demeaning, and condescending uh, way of characterizing the people that they're supposed to be there serving. So when we, I hear testimony that, oh, this is the peer support, I'm like, who, who, where, who's been drinking what Kool Aid? So this, there's a, a staff member who is, well, let's not get personal. There, there's an environment of demeaning, autocratic, authoritarian, retaliatory, and punitive behavior in these facilities. Uh, One person working there was intimately involved with a guest. Uh, Somebody asked for a grievance form. They were fired. I mean, this this is an out-of-control management, and these are what you're calling community partners. Shovel more money at them. This is absolutely wrong. There's also no appeal route. I contacted a number of board members and was told, oh, I'm, I'm not interested. I don't care. I, look, I, I'm, I'm leaving that board. I mean, the 
the boards are not engaged to the point of actually fixing any of these problems. So what you've got now is a system of resentment, subjugation, guests treated as lesser than, the homeless are lorded over. Now, it may be possible to reform these organizations, and it may not. Uh, those falling outside of the system due to intolerance of this or are sleeping under bridges. There's no public restrooms open anywhere in town. There's one porta potty with no sink, no shower. So, the, the, I'm sorry, I have I've run out of time, and I know I have another ten minutes here. So, how would you like to handle it, Mr. Chair? I'm sorry, we have to wrap up now, Stephen. Um, I mean, what what? I mean, we hear your message would, that that that. You know, you're feeling like the organizations that we're talking about under these circumstances are not acting up to a standard that you would that you expect, certainly that we should all expect from them. So um, let me close on a higher note and ask you to take a look at the uh, submissions I made. I sent a few extras in about food and a problem statement that I co-authored with some others uh, advocates in the community. Uh, but the Conestoga huts and the pods are what uh, are an incremental step that are less than a thousand dollars or or so yes tomorrow was prepared to start building those this spring uh i think if i get another opportunity i will i'll, I'll need to dig into this coordinated entry and the privacy implications there's an absolutely failed privacy governance around that but but the the opportunity for uh, a new model is what I would like. I, I can't, I'm, I'm competing with another. Uh... Well, we will take your, um, we have your material that you sent us on our website and that will be part of our homework. Um, we will be picking up this issue again next week uh, with different testimony. But um, no, thank you for your time and thank you for sharing your thoughts um, on this. It is, uh, it is. Well, will I, will I have an opportunity to complete what I'm waving on right now? Because that's, we, we, can, we do we have. Can, we can talk about fitting you in, um, you and I and, and the, the um, and my administrative assistant, uh, committee assistant can work on finding a time um, if you would like to continue testimony, but we we need to finish today. And um, as you know, we're we do have limited time, but we will work with you to try to find more time for you in the next week or so. Thank you. All right. Um, committee, it's two o three, and I want to be respectful of our schedule and our time. Um, we spend um, so thank you very much. I think I'll adjourn today's meeting and. Um, Thank you.